it's the last class. Um, feel free to ask that before we jump into this. But uh, the other topic is is to look at indigenous cultures in the past and indigenous cultures today, right? Uh, in Brazil, and what does that look like? Um, so uh, I'm sure we'll we'll talk about this next week. But I guess you guys are going to get a little bit of a preview, a little bit of an informal lesson before I uh, prepare the PowerPoint for that. Um, I wanted to just show you guys some some clips. Uh, when we talk about uh, Tupi in the in the present tense, we, we talk a lot about the Potiguara. Um, so the Potiguara live in Paraíba and, and there's also some Potiguara in Rio Grande do Norte. And I think there's there might be some other ones, but those are the two main ones that come to my mind. Um, and so the the Paraíba Potiguara, we work directly with them and Navajo has been working with them since the year 2000 on a language revitalization program based on his green book that you have. So that green book is kind of like the Bible of Tupi these days. So it's a really useful book to have. Everybody bases it because it's a really good uh, compilation of all of the source texts that we have uh, and with a good orthography, standard orthography. So it is like the gold standard. Uh, Navajo is the gold standard of Tupi Anchigu as far as like the whole world is concerned. Uh, so that's a good book. So don't feel like you got scammed. I'm just joking. It's a good book to have regardless of whether you want to study Tupi or not. Um, but yeah, we talk a lot about uh, Potiguara. So if we just go on Google Maps, I'll just show you where that is. Um, so Paraíba, if we look at Paraíba, this is the state. So obviously uh, we have Brazil here and admit you. I don't know how to make it admit automatically, but that's fine. Um, welcome. So we have the state of Paraíba here. It's in the Nordeste, right? Right here. And if you zoom in on the Google Maps, even just Google Maps, you can see here there's this this shaded in area right here. And if you click on it, it says Potiguara. This this whole area is just called Potiguara uh, because this is all indigenous land here. So this indigenous land here in Potiguara is, it, it has been uh, Potiguara land forever. So that's one of their, their very proud claims. The people who live here is that uh, they never left and probably almost every other indigenous people group in Brazil at some point or another had to move away from their ancestral lands and they got displaced. Um, you know, not all of them, but on the coast, certainly uh, almost all of them and the Potiguara didn't. So um, they feel that they're very brave and fierce because of that, right? Because they stand their ground. Um, I think a, a big misconception that a lot of people have, this is just a good thing to know going into any sort of indigenous studies, is that, um, and uh, you know, not everybody thinks this way, but it's very common just because of how media is, is that uh, an indigenous person is somebody who lives simply and lives with nature and doesn't, you know, talks to the trees and the animals and, uh, you know, uh, this is a very fantastical image of what it is to be an indigenous person, especially in the modern age. Um, when we look at cultures and we see things like, uh, you know, English as a language is 30% French. Portuguese is starting to get a lot of English words. We have all these things, but when we look at indigenous cultures, we have a ten, we tend to put like a lens of purism on it, where we say, oh, that's not indigenous enough. At a certain point, when you mix the indigenous with European, it just becomes European. Um, and that's a really common perspective that we can have, but it's really important as academic people while we're studying these topics and these peoples and these cultures that, uh, we don't pass judgments like that. We're not trying to measure the degree of indigeneity of the peoples that we are studying, right? Uh, we're just trying to describe them and their languages and their cultures and what they do, not what they should be doing based on what they used to do. Right. We're not trying to project them to 500 years in the past. Uh, modern indigenous people have iPhones. They work normal jobs. They speak Portuguese um, and not all of them do, but some of them do. And so it's a big spectrum. So it's important to try not to uh, get a get a pinhole village when we uh, 
vision when we think about what it means to be indigenous today versus what it means to be indigenous 500, 600 years ago before the Europeans arrived. Does that make sense to everybody? And you, you can see it a lot. Like if you if you if you look at you know indigenous influencers on Instagram or something, and you look in their content, uh, their comment section, you'll see really racist people. You know, saying like, "Oh, you have a iPhone. You know, you should work. Well, I'm paying for everything. All that stuff." Go ahead, Eduardo. Oh, you didn't mean to raise your hand. It was just a thumbs up. But you can talk if you want. Um, so yeah, so I just want to get that out of the way before we go deeper, because it's important to put that academic cap on and say, okay, we're not judging these cultures, right? If 90% of the people in this village are Catholic, and I think that, oh, you know, in the past, the Catholics murdered their ancestors, so how, how could they do this? You have to remember that these are colonized people, right? And it's been 500 years since that happened. So we're not here to judge that. We're just here to describe that. And so a very uh, common word that I'm going to say a lot is syncretism, syncretismo in Portuguese. This is something that's really, really prevalent in the entire American continent, right? From North America all the way to South America. Syncretism is, it, it defines who we are as a people, right? Uh, in the modern age. Um, so when we look at indigenous cultures in the modern age, we will see aspects of Christianity we will see aspects of African religions. We might even see aspects of Buddhism because the fact of the matter is, is that they're modern people. And the most important thing about indigenous identity is sovereignty, okay? The fact that you are a sovereign person. Your culture is defined by you. Nobody, no, no uh, person who studies, no white guy, from the United States who studies at USP is allowed to tell that person what their culture should or should not be, okay? Sovereignty is the most important thing. So some indigenous people will stay true to their pre-contact traditions. Some of them will have become very Christian. Sometimes it's predatory, sometimes it's not. Uh, so it's important that we try to be really objective when we look at these cultures. All right, um, so, uh, I wanted to show you guys some videos. Uh, the professor and I took a trip to uh, to Paraíba. Let's see. Can you hear that through your computer? You can give me a thumbs up if you heard that audio for a second. Yeah, you heard it? Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to play this video, but real quick, I just want to get the Quapa. And then... Uh, Ubu... Hang on. I just want to find the lyrics for you so we can follow along um, because this is in the Quapa. So what we're going to see is something called the Tore. And so Tore is something that is, uh, is a shape of the water. Cool. so much easier to find this on my phone. All right, I'll just play the song and then we'll see. That's Navajo. 
<laughs> he looks so happy, doesn't he? All right. Uh, so that's the tore. It's basically this circular dance. It's a ritual where they they walk in a circle and they chant together. And so this has been a very important aspect of the revitalization uh, uh, project because most of the people in Paraiba are are very uh, Christian. So uh, you might notice that uh, there's some Christian aspects in these lyrics. So let's go over these lyrics real quick together. Uh, these are the lyrics that they're singing. These are in the Quapa that I sent you guys, so you can go and look at it. And I can send you guys this video too if you wanna if you wanna see it. Let me make this smaller. So, she tupang, she tupang, she potinguara. So he's saying, I am God, I am God, I am Potiguara. Uh, Potiguara is a compound word between shrimp and eater. I think I mentioned this in the other class. So wara can be uara. It would be the person who eats. So the people who eat shrimp, Potiguara. She Potiguara, this ko would be similar to like this or nesti, nesta. So kotupang uvu. Ubu is a word that we're going to counter a lot. Um, you'll see it in a lot of uh, Guarani villages. So uh, if we look in Sao Paulo, this is where we are right now, right? Um, if we zoom in here, you'll see that there's some more, there's some more indigenous areas on the coast of uh, Sao Paulo down here in Itanhaém. Itanyain, right? And that's a that's a Tupi word right there. Itanyain. And let's see if we can find one. Peribe. This one is called Peruibe. But you'll you'll see this word uvu a lot. Uvu like that. Uh in Guarani they write it with the V and in, in uh in Tupi, we write it with a B. Um, this she is a shortened form of saying me. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to teach you guys about are, are the pronouns real quick. And so we're going to go into language real quick, and then we'll go back into the culture of it. Um, so the pronouns that we have, the first person pronouns, jump into the grammar pronouns personal pronouns are here so this is your first first to be lesson the last one i was just trying to show you guys a lot of things just to give you an overview this is the most basic thing these are the pronouns you want to know ishe me and de you ore us yande us including the second person the person i'm talking to as the speaker you pe Y'all and ae, they. Um, so these pronouns are subject pronouns. Anytime you see this full form of the pronoun, uh, it's going to be basically uh, a noun. You can treat it always as a noun. If you see this full form, it's a noun. You'll notice here that when we say shetupeng, that's actually not saying ishe. There's no I at the front. So that's a reduced form. Uh, that's actually the prefix that I was describing to you guys before. Go ahead, Edward. Eduardo. So I'm now like myself. Say that again. A noun kind of like myself. Yeah, like well, the word myself. Yeah, it's like uh, it would be like saying I eu. It's like the noun eu. You know how we have a difference in Portuguese between eu, me, meu. These are all like one's possessive, right? So, uh, so here I, I have a really potentially confusing but potentially useful thing. So tell me, guys, if if this is confusing or useful for you. Let me close this. So, a simple example. The word in Tupi for father, right, is going to be tuba. Tuba. Very easy. Tuba. Tuba. 
Everyone can say that to themselves. We're in class together. Tuba. And the B is a little less. I'm pronouncing it too much. It's more like tuba. Tuba. Like that. So tuba is father. This is in the absolute form. Okay? It has a T in the front of it. If you search this in the dictionary, it'll just look like uba. So when the T is in the front, this is like a, like a father. Nobody's father in specific, just a father. Okay? So this is a case system in tupi. Don't feel like you need to memorize this all now. I'm just trying to sh like get you used to it, okay? So don't feel overwhelmed by this. Now, if I want to say my father, I'm going to say she, and the T becomes an R. That means that it's in the genitive case. That means it's possessive. So she ruba. So if, if I say, for example, in tupi, ishe tuba, uh, that literally means I am a father, right? I'm somebody's father. I didn't say whose father I am. I just said I am a father. And the thing you need to understand about tupi is there is no copula, okay? And a copula in linguistics, for those of you who aren't linguistic, it's the verb to be, right? More specifically, the verb ser in Portuguese, because in Portuguese you have estar and you have ser. Estar is, is, we do have it in tupi. We have estar. So you can use to be in the sense of like a, like a gerund, right? Like I am running continuously. We can say that. We would say like, uh, we would say, Anyan uh, guicobo, I am running, as opposed to Anyan, I ran, right? Anyan guicobo. So that's like very similar to Portuguese. We have that verb. But when it comes to ser, like, to be like a, like a property of oneself, describing oneself, what we use is this concept of equivalence. And so if we go into the, uh, into the quaffa, let me see. So let's go into the quaffa here, let's see. It's always hard for me to find this because my, uh, for some reason the Mac, like, search thing doesn't search things through the dictionary in the same way that this is so this book by the way uh just to give you some context on the different learning materials we have for us for the language oh i happened to land on the page that i wanted um this book is 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 aimed to be like a kind of any age introduction there is some technical stuff but uh, I can show you guys a, a, a more easy one. So we, we have different levels. Navajo's book is very dense. And uh, the aim of Navajo's book, the, the Metodo Moderno de Tupi Antigo, is uh, the aim is to teach people how to translate old Tupi texts into Portuguese. Okay? So... That's a difference between uh, when I learned it, I started with that book, but then I started to create my own method for describing the grammar that made a little more sense in the context of Tupi. But in that book, it might be a little easier to, to digest than my grammar if you're not a linguist because the words are in terms of uh, Portuguese. So things like nouns, things like verbs, things like adjectives that we have in Portuguese, that's the way it's described in the book. In my grammar, I'm calling it stated verbs. That could be confusing. So uh, as we all discussed in the group, I'm going to use Navajo's method. I'm going to try not to say my grammatical stuff. But if you have further questions about it, feel free to ask me. But I'm going to try to just speak in terms of Portuguese, just like we do in the Green Book. Um, so something that I didn't see in the Green Book, which is, is really useful, that I love inside the Quafa is this description of igualdade ou equivalência, right? So here we have two words, and they're both nouns. We have cunha, cunha, you guys know what that means already, right? If you watch BBB, you know we had uh, cunha poranga, that means beautiful woman in Tupi, cunha poranga. So, uh, yeah, Isabelli, that's her name. I forgot it for a second. Isabelli is cunha puranga. So, uh, so cunha means woman. That's a noun. Now we have this word. Moro, mboe, sara. Okay? Literally, this, this verb, uh, 
uh, if we want to break it down, let me break it down real quick for you in the text editor so you guys can see what, what this word means. Because the cool thing about Tupi is that almost every you know complex word that we have in Tupi, you can, you can understand it if you haven't seen it before, if you know what all the parts are. So what we have here is we have moro, boe, sara. This literally means uh, people, teach, doer, okay? A professor, right? That makes sense to everybody, right? So this means people, moro, that's the object of the verb. Boe is to teach somebody something. I'm teaching you something, boe. Morom boe, I'm teaching people. Nobody in specific. If I want to say I'm Eduardo's teacher, I can say Ishe Eduardo Bo E Sara. I am the teacher of Eduardo. Okay? So so this is the object space. When you see Moro, that just means people in general. It's a general noun. Nobody in specific. I just teach people. So Morombo esara means professor. That's a simple noun. So if we want to say that that woman is a professor, we don't have it, we don't, or we do have it, but we don't have the and we don't have a. Okay, we don't have these definite and indefinite articles. We can tell that by the context. So if I, if we're talking about some woman and you say, oh, what does that woman do for a job? And I say, cunha morombo esara. Because these two words are nouns and they're next to each other, we have this concept of equivalence. We don't need a verb. They are, they are being compared to each other on a scale. They're equal to each other. So uh, as a result, in Tupi, we can just keep adding like names onto people. And in old Tupi culture, this was something that was regular. And this is something that... Uh, at least my friends who are in the Hetomada that are that are Potiguara, they're they're taking back the language. They still do this. So, at a big life event, a Tupi uh, indigenous man. I'm not sure if this was common practice for women, but I know for a fact that the men used to do this. For example, if they went to war and they fought a good war, if they had a really good hunt, if they had a child, they would get a new name. So as your life goes on, your name grows with all of your experiences. And so that's very similar to like a European king, right? Like, uh, I don't know. I'll just make one up like Sir Lancelot, defeater of the dragon, freer of the slaves. Like, you know, they say it in like a uh, Game of Thrones. It's very much like that. Um, so the longer your name was in the old times pre-contact, and to be the more important you were, like you were a, what we call avaete, avaete. Uh, so ava, who remembers what ava means? Who remembers? Ava, so ava means uh, it's the opposite of kunya. It means man. So avaete, man. Ete, you'll see everywhere. Uh, you can have. Uh, Tamandu Atei. Has anyone ever been there? Tamandu Atei. It's a stop on the station. So when you see, when you hear Tamandu Atei, let me, let me write it down for all of you. <laughs> it's a long word. Tamandu Atei, like that. So this te here in the Portuguese word comes from this word that means ete, which means valente or uh, verdadeiro, right? The real deal. The real deal. This thing's the real thing, right? So when you see Tamandua Tei, we're saying the real Tamandua, the river of the real Tamandua, uh, as opposed to a different one. So this might be a Tamandua Bandeira, right? A, a different species of Tamandua, which is different than the normal one. So Tamandua Tei. You'll see Taman, uh, uh, and this E is, is the U. Uh. So the taman dua et ete u. That's what the uh, the tupi would be. This is Portuguese today. This is tupi. 
antigo. Tomando até, tomando até e like that. Um, and so we also see that with uh, Yaguara. An interesting thing that happened in in Tupi Antigo when uh, the Europeans came is that the Europeans brought dogs with them. In Brazil, there were no dogs. We had uh, panthers right here in Brazil, but there was no dog. So when the dogs came, the Tupi were like, these look like Yaguara. So in Tupi Anchigo, pre-contact, Yaguara meant panther. Post-contact, Yaguara changed. It started to mean dog because dogs, you see the dog every day. You call it Yaguara. You see it much more often than you see the panther in the forest, at least hopefully because those things were scary. Um, and you, uh, yeah, go ahead, Diana. Okay, you're just laughing. Uh, so yeah, so Yaguara means dog, okay? And what happened was, what happened to the actual Yaguara, right? Yaguara. Yaguara, it became Yaguare de, the real onsa, right? Not the other one, the real one. So this becomes Yaguarete over time. Yeah, go ahead, Eduardo. I'm not sure if you guys are uh, talking, but I can't hear you at the moment. Feel free to speak if you want. We're typing on the chat. Okay, let me see the chat. All right. Let let me move the chat where I can see it. Okay. Kian, do you know where to buy a physical copy of this book? Are you talking about the Tupi Poti Guaracuapa? Um, yes, I am. Yeah, so that one is not printed yet. When it is, I'll try to get, get it to you guys, but currently it's only been released as a PDF. So if you'd like to print it, that's the, that's the best way to do it, unfortunately. Uh, I got it on my Kindle. Let's see. Does it have an, anything to do with wolf like Lobu Guar? No, I don't think there was any wolves here. Um, but there was fox. There were foxes, which in my head, I'm like, why didn't they just call the dogs foxes? But I guess to them, the dogs that the Portuguese brought looked more like Yaguara than they looked like the, the fox, which I'm forgetting the name for it right now. Um, but yeah, there, there was no, there was no, there was no, uh, and it's interesting because today we say uh, we say onsa, whereas in other parts of the world they say jaguar. It's more common. There is lobo guara, right? Here, let's take a look. If you guys ever have a question about something, you can you can uh, you can search it in here, and you're really likely going to find something. So here it is, right here. Guara news awara is lobo guara plus new is campo. You see that? So Awara was the name for Lobo Guara. There you go. It's Tupi. You answered your own question. This dictionary is extremely, extremely useful. Like if, if you see, so Yaguara, Yaguare, Yaguare, Ibe. Yeah, yeah, it's similar to all of those things. Yaguara, all of those are different names with the word Yaguara as a construct, right? So if we, uh, so if we go Jaguare, like that, you'll see an entry here. In this source, which I'll add soon, it means cão fedorento, right? Yaguara, onça, and then rem, re. It became re in Portuguese, but it was rem, which means smelly. Nema, Ipanema, Ipanema, smelly lake. Ooh, nema. So it's sometimes it's rem, sometimes it's nem. So you have yaguare. And then Yaguaribe, let's search it up here. Yaguaribe, there you go. So you, this one, Yaguara Upe, no Rio das Onças, in the river of the Jaguars. This Pe is like a postposition. It means na, in. It's a locative marker. So in the river, Pe, Yaguari, uh, Jaguaribe. Just like that. Pretty cool, huh? So this dictionary, if you save it on your home screen, on your phone, 
uh, I highly recommend you make a bookmark for it because you're, you're going to be going around just any second that you leave your house, you are going to see something and you're going to say that really looks to be. You type it into the dictionary, it takes one second, hit enter. Now you have an exact idea of what it means. You do this over the course of a few months, you'll learn to be without even realizing it. It's super fun. And if you guys like, um, for example, maybe it would be a really fun field trip for us to do is going to the Jardim Botanico. There's a there's a botanical garden here in Sao Paulo. In uh, it's really far away. It's like 50 minutes from Uspi probably, but it's really big. And a lot of people talk about the one in Rio. I've been to the one in Rio. I've been to the one here. The one in Rio is really cool if you like like Brazilian imperial history because the emperor constructed it and it's really old and it has plants from all over the world and the country. It's really beautiful. But the one in Sao Paulo is just like objectively bigger and there's more stuff. And there's this one part of it where it has all the story of Anchieta, the flora and fauna, Tupi. It has a lot of really good information in there and all these specimens. And if you look at the specimens, all the names of them, you just sit there the whole day with the dictionary typing it in. Oh, Kuya. Oh, what's this animal? Abakashi, Anana. You know, there's all these different things to look at and you just send, type in the names. What did that mean? What does this mean? Because they don't write it out. It doesn't say what it means, but you can find it. So it's, it's really cool. We should do that as a, as a field trip. So yeah, so that's the concept that I wanted to teach you guys today uh, is this equality. Cunha morombo esaba. Morombo esara. She is a teacher. Ishe kian. I am kian. Ishe kian. A e Eduardo. A e Diana. Right? He's Eduardo. She's Diana. Okay? If, if does that make sense to everyone is is anyone like confused about that i think it's easier than most languages it's like you just put two nouns next to each other it's good um the other thing when you see two nouns next to each other is that it could be a, a sequence right so if i want to say ishe eduardo diana uh ore uh, okay, so I want to say we are all that. We can just list people. And then if the verb is conjugated in the plural, we understand that that's a group. It's not an equivalence. So it takes a little time to get used to it. But trust me, it's not as confusing as it seems. And then there's the genitive relation. This is the other thing in Tupi, which is more similar to English than in Portuguese. So shrimp house. That's how you want to think. Think in English when you're when you're thinking about these things. You say, which way do I put it? Think in English. Shrimp house. House of the shrimp. Okay. My house. House mia casa. Casa de mim. <laughs> Deroca. Right? So this this is oka. Means house. I think everybody knows what oka means. Oka means house. You'll see this in a lot of words. For example, we can we can put two words together. I'm gonna challenge you guys. If you've learned this word already, tupang, and now I taught you oka, what is tupang oka? What is God house? Church. Yeah. Tupi is so easy, isn't it? Tupang oka. Church, God house. Super easy. Tupang oka. Pretty cool, huh? Now, uh, something to note here. I'm not going to get into this uh, right now, but the main thing I wanted to show you is uh, that you can use this to describe things, right? Um, but you can also use the she to be possessive. And that's what we're seeing with this sheroka here, okay? And that's what we see with the sheruba, right? So up here we have tuba, father, in general. Ishe tuba. I am somebody's father. I am a father. I am father. I father, quite literally. I father. She uh, ruba. The second you see this uh, form, the small form, not the full form, 
that's how you know that I teach it to you guys like it's a prefix because it's easier that way. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to put a space, okay? We're not going to do it. But if you want to do it in secret, I won't tell. Uh, so this prefix, she, uh, is possessive. So this is creating a genitive relationship. My father, Sheruba. So when you have a pluriform root, that's going to happen. That doesn't happen with every root. And that's the confusing thing about pluriforms, which you're just going to get the hang of it over time. Uh, for example, S is mother, right? In general, she S, my mother. You notice there's no R, there's nothing. It's because it doesn't start. It's not a pluriform. Uh, it'll only do that if it's a, if it has a vowel. And even then, it doesn't always do it. Now, there's something interesting about pluriforms compared to other things is that they get a little bit more specific. Like if I say Tupan Oka, that means Church of God, right? Or more, more, more reasonably, House of God. House of God in general. In general, right? Now, if I say Tupan Roca with an R, now I'm saying it's God's house possessively like it's his house it's in his possession it's his house as opposed to this is a house devoted to him or about him or you see the difference there so this 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 uh, genitive relationship will tell you the difference when there's a pluriform but don't worry about that too much right now so we have sheruba so here's where it gets a little bit weird is that you can use it as an adjective any noun in tupi can be an adjective Okay, and all you have to do is get rid of the A. Sherub. I have a dad. I am dadded. <laughs> it doesn't make too much sense in English or Portuguese, but like it's like an adjective, right? Like it's a, uh, this is what I call stative verbs. We're going to learn it like it's an adjective. They function like adjectives. So, like, if having a dad were an adjective, then that's how you would express it. Here's something you're going to notice is that she su, because it ends with a vowel that's not an A, uh, it doesn't change at all. So that can also mean I have a mother. So this is where the context is really important. In the past, pre-contact culture, Tupi was not... A written language never nobody wrote down to be as far as we know until the Europeans got here okay the Portuguese were the first people to write in to be and uh, because of that when you have a spoken language which has never been written you can imagine that the function of language is very different if I'm writing you a letter from where I live and I'm trying to describe events to you that happened that you can't physically see the language that develops out of that necessity is going to be much more explicit, right? Much more descriptive and much less context heavy, right? Like if you, if I say something to you in Portuguese, if I just say compre, what does that mean? Compre. What does that mean? What did I buy? You need context, right? There needs context. I need to tell you what I bought. Why did I buy it? Where did I buy it, right? In 2P, there was no writing, so it's not like I'm sending a letter to somebody. If I'm using language, it's because there's somebody else in front of me who is experiencing the exact same thing that I'm experiencing. Does that make sense? So that's why these languages are so high context. We don't need to be so specific when when we're both experiencing the same thing, right? Um, and so that's an interesting thing about about the uh, the language itself, which is affected by the culture. It's affected by the fact that uh, it's not it wasn't a written written language, and that words didn't travel very far. It was traveled by the voice, right? Um, so you'll get situations like this where if I say shesu you'll have to figure out whether I'm saying my mother or I have a mother. Um, in many cases, the difference really, like in our heads, it makes a difference. 
but in the actual conversation, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, like if I said, whose mother is this? And I said, I have a mother. That might sound a little strange, but in the context, right? If you're there and I do that, the communication is complete, right? There's no, there's no loss of communication there. Like, you know that it's my mother. I don't have to say my mother. I could say I have a mother, right? That might be confusing in English, but in Tupi, it's completely fine. All right. Are there any questions about this? Let's get out of the language for a moment. We've got like 15 minutes left. Uh, let me look at the chat. Maybe you guys are sending me messages. Nope. All right, perfect. Uh, so... I show you guys this picture. So when uh, when the Portuguese arrived, right, and the Dutch and the Spanish and the French, they were all there in Brazil hundreds of years ago. They constructed these what they call aldeamentos, right, settlements. Uh, these settlements, and so these were like pueblos. Missions, presidios, and pueblos. Yeah, so that was like a Spanish thing, but the Portuguese did that too. So this is the Igreja de São Miguel in, uh, I think, Três Rios in Baía da Traição. So this church is the original church that is still there. And it's just sitting there in ruins. It's not protected. It's not, it's just sitting there in the Potiguara land. There's no plaque. There's no history. Nothing. It's just it's just kind of there. So a lot of this history has kind of been cast to the side by contemporary uh, Brazilian society. It's not being valued too much. Um, I just want to show you guys. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because this a place like this to these guys here. Um, these guys, you can see uh, there's me. This is Ezekiel. This is Homildo. So this these are the guys who wrote the Quapa. He's the main author. And then uh, Danilo. Mateus and then Ezekiel. These guys all helped out with it. Here's Navajo and here's Tupinizando, if you guys know who that guy is. So uh, inside this church, basically, as a way of taking back their language, they started praying Pai Nosso, right? And uh, we'll listen to that sometime. I took a video of it um, and I put the subtitles in English and Portuguese and Tupi, so it'll be a good learning material for you guys. Uh, just a disclaimer when you learn about Tupi Anchigu, you're gonna have to read religious texts. Um, some people like that because they're Christian, actually, a lot of people are, some people don't. Uh, I'm not right, but I recognize that it, it's the only material that we have, and so it's important to have a really good understanding of this material, uh, in order to understand the cultures and, and languages because even though most of it is tainted by uh, European perspective and things like that, it, it is still important for us to understand it in depth because it's, it's a part of history, right? Um, and we can use it to kind of help these people decolonize as much as they need to, right? But we're not forcing them to decolonize. It's just like uh, they're going through these processes of creating more interesting uh, recourses. So. So this is an extremely thing, and this is a common thing that would happen is they would create these churches and then they would uh, have the people come in and they would teach them about Jesus. They would offer them food. They would offer them protection. They would build these strong forts and uh, and they would make them into slaves. Right. Um, that didn't happen as much here. It did happen, but it was more common in the Amazon. Um, there was a lot of tears. There's a lot of emotions that come from these people when, when they go into a place like this. But to them, it's their heritage. They feel more connected to their ancestors. Um, so it's important that we preserve these kind of cultural spaces for them, I think, and for ourselves, because it's a part of, uh, it's a part of our history, those of us who love this country and we love being in here. Uh, it's important for us to, to take the value in that, right? Um, all right. So this is an interesting photo of the mission. We looked at that. We looked at the Quapa. We learned a little bit. How do you guys feel? Let me take a look at the chat. 
You feel good? Really interesting. Very Sorry, interesting. Sorry, I've got so much echo on my mic. I don't know why. It's very dramatic. It is dramatic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a really uh, important book. Romildo is going to be here next week, as I said. You can see Avaete Potinguara, right? The valiant man of Potiguara, Oikubera que e paraipe, that used to live here. So, so these are really useful for you guys to read it. You, can, you don't have to, you know, understand the Tupi side, but if you read the Portuguese side, it tells you a lot about the culture too, even if you're not interested in the language. The, each chapter starts with one of these chants. It's really cool. And inside here, you're going to find um, activities to do, right? So we have demonstratives here. Uh, you'll find uh, these kind of things. So I think it would be cool for us to, to work through this when we do look at the language. Um, obviously, we're going to look at Navajo stuff as well. Uh, because he was the one that suggested it to look at this, but I don't want to make him mad if, uh, if he doesn't want to look at it. But yeah, see, like, like it's all written out here. This is what I was just describing to you. Ete, verdadero, yaguarete. You can see these are all the different modifiers that you can put on the back. Has anyone here seen mirin before? Moji mirin, right? Mirin means small. You probably already knew that. Did you, did you guys already like, you already felt like mirin means small as a Brazilian maybe. But yeah, it means small. Un means preto, right? Ran means false. So you can do this to, to create all these different words in Tupi. It's a very uh, fun, constructive language. Um, let's see. I wanted to do one more cultural thing with you guys to show you something about the uh, culture, but I, uh, my sick brain forgot. I can't remember exactly what to do. So, uh, yeah, I'll just open it up to discussion. How do you guys feel? Discussion question. Uh, how do you guys feel about seeing the language and also seeing, uh, those rituals and stuff? Um, for example, this ritual I showed you. The, the Tore. When you see this ritual like uh, of these people dancing in this like fluorescently lit room, but they're also, you know, they have, uh, let, let's take a look at these instruments real quick. They, they have maraca, right? If you speak English, right? Loretta, right? Maraca is a word in English. Tupi is everywhere. Maracas. These are, these are indigenous instruments from before people ever is arrived. That where the word comes from yes Tupi. yes oh, wow. it didn't even change it's the same maracas it's the same in english nothing changed also ananas right uh this this headdress that they're wearing is called akanga tara akanga means head tara means uh i don't remember but the beauty is that i made this website so that you don't have to question it akanga tara I guess there's no there's no etymology for a kangatara. It just means. But see, you you can see these Portuguese words. So canitar. I don't know. Sometimes I find these Portuguese words. If you see it in capitalized, these are like colloquial Portuguese words, which come from tupi. Some other really fun ones are uh, pipoca, right? So uh, one of the big things you'll see is that Brazilian culinary traditions are rooted in indigenous uh, foods. So pipoca means popcorn, right? Uh, poc in Tupi is the verb estalar, ahebentar, estorar, right? Explode. Poc means to explode. So if I say pipoc, that means pira, poca, uh, exploded skin. That's what popcorn is. It's just an exploded skin. You get the corn inside and you explode it out of the skin. That's popcorn. So pipoca, there you go. Um, mandioca, right? Mandioca. 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 That comes from a story about uh, an indigenous folklore story, which I could tell you guys about it um, sometime. Mandioca. Uh, Aipin. Aipin. Aipin is also... Man, you know, it means the same thing. It's similar. Go ahead, Edward. So mandioca would be like the house of Mundi? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Have you guys heard this story before? 
No. So I don't know uh, if this is a pre-contact story or post-contact story, but it is an indigenous story. I'll give you a rundown. There's a lot of different versions of it, but basically uh, Mani was this daughter and um, basically she, she was this daughter of this cacique. And as, as you guys know, indigenous people in Brazil are really dark. But apparently this daughter was born really white. For some reason, she was albino. And so as she grew up, she she grew this really big connection with the moon. And so she would always sneak away from the village at nighttime and she would go and talk to the moon. And so uh, over time, the, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I don't remember if it was her father or her brother. Or someone got suspicious and they're like, why is she spending so much time over there? And she went and she saw, they saw that she was talking to the moon. And so uh, basically they said, you can't come back. And something happened. I don't remember clearly, um, but basically for some reason the moon got mad and it made her sick. So she got sick and she died. And so the people were really sad about what had happened. And so they held a funeral and they buried her and they started crying over her grave. And because uh, the moon felt bad, basically put power in their tears. So when their tears fell, it sprouted a plant from her body, um, which created this plant. And uh, they dug up the roots and the roots were pale, right? Manjoka is white when you skin it. It was pale, just like her skin. And so they believe that that became the house of her soul, Manji Oka, right? The house of Mani. So that became where her house is. So that's a that's a folklore, uh, not a folklore, but like a tradition. I don't know exactly where it comes from, if it's pre or post. Um, uh, the professor would definitely know more about that kind of stuff than I would. Uh, but it's an interesting story, right? So that's a, a possible etymology of Manji Oka, which is uh, the house of Mani. So is it Mandi, the word for soul? Yeah, so in Tupi we have uh, we have allomorphs, right? So um, sometimes in a nasal environment you're gonna get ni, and sometimes you're gonna get ndi. So for example, nde, uh, nde is a is a is the equivalent of she, right? Ishe she, nde nde. It's the shorter form that we use for the prefixes. Sometimes you'll just see ne. So N and M sometimes have an extra consonant. Sometimes ma becomes mba. And sometimes na becomes nda. So in some nasal environments, it might be mani oka. In some, it might be mandi oka. And that's why in, in some language, you'll actually see it be called maniok, like that. Because, uh, because some people didn't hear it. Uh, maniok. Probably in a manihot is pretty common in African languages. Uh, just a, a quick fun fact. Uh, if you guys know what fufu is, West African food, it's basically this, they pound this, uh, the manjoka, the yuca. There's a lot of names for this. But it all comes from South America and the Caribbean. Basically, uh, West African people used to, they create this paste. Let me, just, let me just show you. I don't know why I'm trying to show you with my hands. Fufu. It looks like this. They eat it with everything. It's a, it's a really uh, tasty starch. And so basically, they pound it. Sok, soka, right? Pasoka, this verb in, of pounding is sok in, tup, in tupi. Pasoka is like pounded something. Uh, pounded amenduing. So they would make a soka of it. And then it creates this goop that they, they pick it up. They dip it in whatever they're eating and they eat it. They used to make that out of plantain. Then when the new world was discovered, uh, the slave ships, which were bringing people back and forth, would bring the manjoka from Brazil back to West Africa. They ended up planting it there and it just exploded. This is one of the most fundamental aspects of West African cuisine. And uh, it didn't exist pre-contact. Same thing with tomatoes in Italy. Same thing with, uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks like Pito. Same thing with, uh, you know, uh, potatoes in Ireland and Russia, right? Uh, all this stuff was American. Pre, Pre-contact, none of this would happen. So, uh, you know, really shaped it. But yeah, 
I'll cut it off there. We're getting to the end of the hour. I said I will only do an hour, so that was it. Uh, I appreciate you guys for wanting to learn, even though you could have had a canceled class. You're better than I was. <laughs> I wasn't a very good student when I was in my undergrad, but yeah, it was a pleasure to teach you guys. I think I recorded this, so I'm going to put it on YouTube. I'll post the link in the group. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll teach you guys how to say thank you in uh, Tupi before we leave. We'll say this a lot. We practice together. Ah. Yebete. Oh, yebete. Like that. Oh, yebete. Go ahead, Diana. Oh, yebete. Oh, yebete. Perfect. Could you send us this uh, Word Pad document? Yeah. Yeah, I can thank send you. this to you. It, it also has notes from other classes I've done. It's pretty long. <laughs> but yeah, I'll send you all of it. Maybe you'll be curious but it might not make sense. No problem. All right, any more questions before I close the meeting? All right, sounds good. I can't write the, the I with the, with the tilde, so I'm gonna write an N. This is from Tupi Potiguara. This is a neologism. This means see you later. It's cute, right? See you later. Na inya ing, ao yebete. Ciao.